Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Resilient Leadership Podcast, where everything we talk about is aimed at helping you lead with a greater sense of calm, clarity, and conviction, even in anxious times. Bridget, how are you? I am doing great, Irvin. It's so nice to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing great as well. Thank you so much. Enjoying a little bit of the spring uh, weather, so I am. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a great time of year. We can be hopeful at any rate. It's a bit chilly out today, but we are ever hopeful. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So today's episode is a really interesting episode. We're going to talk about trust, but we're going to talk about trust in a really interesting way, and that is broken trust. And how do you put the pieces of trust back together after it's been broken? Now, mm -hmm. stick around, because at the end of the podcast, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a trust audit to help you determine where your level of trust is in the relationships in your life. But uh, first of all, uh, Bridget, you know, why do you think trust is so important? Well, gosh, where do I start, right? Mm. <laughs> it is something that uh, I'm sure the listeners feel affects their pretty much every facet of their life, their leadership, their relationships. You know, I know as a coach, and I bet this is true for you too, I often will be on calls with folks and the issue is a breakdown of trust. Yeah. And I think that while that's a pretty universal experience, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily know how to repair it. So that's why I'm excited about this podcast episode, because I think we can all use reminders. We can all use help figuring out how to get on the other side of that. But here's an interesting thing. So Professor Paul Zak has done quite a bit of research around looking at a comparison between companies that have high levels of trust and those that have low levels of trust. And like, how does that shake out, you know? And what he found is that in companies with high trust, this to me is doesn't surprise me, but the statistics are pretty profound. In the high trust companies, employees report the following, 75% less stress than their counterparts, 50% higher productivity, 76% more engagement, and 40% less burnout. Mm. Wow. So, I mean, those, those numbers kind of speak for themselves, right? And we, we know this intuitively because the wear and tear of a breakdown in stress is significant, but, but maybe I guess the place to start, and I know that you love to ground everything in neuroscience. So, so what about the brain, human brain and trust? Can you share with listeners that might give us some good insight? Yeah. Well, Trust in many ways predates human societies. I mean, you think about it, it's the building glue of all relationships. And so mm -hmm. if you just think back to evolution and how we survived as a species, trust was essential because it's the, the building block really of human society mm -hmm. and uh, relationships just can't prosper without them. And, you know, what's interesting, you mentioned this professor, Paul Zach, he's actually done some amazing research as well, neuroscientific research. And we have actually identified, believe it or not, the neurochemical that builds trust, and it's, uh, it's called oxytocin. Mm -hmm. And oxytocin is the building block of trust. And mm -hmm. so we know that when a person feels they are in a safe and trusting environment, it produces higher levels of oxytocin. And what's interesting as well is, is where, with a part of the brain that that floods, because it's in the prefrontal cortex, it's not in the amygdala where we think all the emotions are. Mm -hmm. And I think there could be a tie in there to that statistic at the beginning, because, you know, when our prefrontal cortex is working at its optimal level, then things like critical analysis, um, like logical thinking, like creative thinking or verbal ability, all of those are increased. So so when we have greater trust, we have higher levels of oxytocin and our prefrontal cortex is working at a higher level. And so therefore it's, that's why it impacts our performance. Makes total sense. It's yeah. that, that it helps us access, basically trust helps us access our higher mind, our yeah. higher level thinking. Absolutely. Yeah. So hugely important. Yeah. That's fascinating. So I guess we have to talk about what trust is, although it seems like you know it when you have it and you know yep. when you don't, right? Yep. yep. How would you go about describing the ingredients of, of trust? Well, I think the first thing we have to put on the table is to say that trust is an assessment. Hmm. 
it, it's not like a fact, right? Like yeah. you and I might have a relationship with uh, a colleague and you might trust the colleague and I don't. Who's right? Yeah. Who's wrong? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So it's an assessment. And it's an assessment around, do I have confidence in this person? Do mm -hmm. I think this person has my back? If I do, I trust them. And if I don't, I don't. Yeah. But it even gets more interesting than that. So Charles Feldman, in his really interesting book called The Thin Book of Trust, he kind of paints a picture of when we make this assessment about whether somebody is friend or foe, right? Whether we trust them or not, we're basing it on four different things. Now, we don't know we're doing this because it's beneath conscious awareness. But what we're looking at is the following four things. One, does this person care? Like, mm -hmm. do they care about me? Do they have my interests at heart? Because if they don't, I'm not going to trust them. Yeah. Second thing is sincerity. Do they say what they mean? And do they mean what they say? Because mm -hmm. I'm not going to trust somebody who speaks out of both sides of their mouth. And then it's about competence. All right. Mm -hmm. If I'm working with them, I got to trust that you can get the job done, that you have the skills mm -hmm. needed. Yep. And then the last one's reliability. It's not just about competence in a work setting. It's do you follow through on your commitments and your promises mm -hmm. on a regular basis so that I can trust in your commitments, right? And depending on how I assess you in those four areas, I may or may not trust you. I may partially trust you. I may say, hey, I'm not going to trust you at all. And I think understanding that's so helpful because sometimes we just go, you know what? I'm, I don't trust this person. Yeah. But we don't explicitly know in what domains yeah. we've made that assessment, right? Yeah, I love that. That, that is, wow, that's so powerful to be able to kind of break down trust into its granular levels and to really, you know, because you get that all the time. There are people, you know, who I think are the most caring people. Yeah. However, I don't quite trust them to get the job done. They're not quite reliable, but I'll have a beer with them anytime because they're, yes. they're a wonderful company. And, and it's interesting there for the complexity of trust. Therefore, it isn't, you know, and at times we kind of feel, what is it? We have reticence about this person. And it's not that they're not nice people, but it's, it's that trust requires a level of those four areas, which I think is fascinating. Yeah, it really is. And that people are assessing us all the time, mm -hmm. just like we're assessing them. And I think sometimes we fail to recognize, particularly as leaders, it's a two-way street. You know, I might not trust somebody on my team or somebody I'm managing, but they might not find me trustworthy. And of course, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, today I'm going to break trust, <laughs> but it just happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes even in our most intimate, you know, close relationships. Yeah. yeah? yeah. So, so Urban, speak a little bit about that. Like what happens when trust is broken. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting because I think it's a little, just like the definition, a little complex, complex as well. And I think we can pick up on different behaviors, which when you diagnose and go beneath the surface, really what we're dealing with there is, is, is some form of a deficit of trust. So one thing is the sharing of opinions. And mm -hmm. people become reticent to share their opinions. And so what do you tend to happen is that information is a one-way flow. It's kind of top down and people don't feel they can step in and give their opinion. You know, part of that is, well, if I don't trust what's, how that's going to be received, if I don't trust people have their best interest for me, yeah. why would I do that? Why would I, you know, kind of step in and risk and remember, this is, it's risk, you know, trust is about risk and, yes. and, and survival. It goes back to those primitive times. And so yes. we feel risk, we're not going to trust. So, so you, you, you might um, have just a one-way communication. And then the second thing is, which is interesting, I've seen this a lot in leadership, is just not walking the talk. So there's no congruence. Yeah, and sometimes, like you know, we, we, yeah, we find ourselves, you know, saying things and, and it, we feel it's like a harmless lie, but we <laughs> do it for the best intentions and it breaks down trust. And, you know, where I've seen this in organizations is, you know, I've had situations where decisions being made at the top, but the person is afraid to tell his employees that this is being made. So he, he pretends that, oh, you know, I just would love your input in this. Oh, yes. And, and, and then what happens, of course, is that people find out, wait a minute, that's already been, you know, the decision yeah. is being made. And of course, <laughs> trust is shattered. And, oh, I've seen that a lot. Yes. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, it's done in, with a good intention, 
Yes. But because it's it's incongruent really with with the platform of trust, therefore it breaks trust down. Yeah. And then the other one, it's it's interesting. I think what I've noticed is people will share their wins, but not their concerns. Hmm. So we create an atmosphere where it's okay to say what's working, but uh. we we're afraid to say what might not be working. And of course, you yeah. know, history is replete with people, situations where there were problems and no one spoke up. Yes. And we all have a culture around mistakes. And, and of course, is it okay to make a mistake? Is it okay to talk about problems? And all of that really is based on trust. Yeah. A platform of trust that I can actually speak up. You know, part of, as I'm listening to you, Irvin, what I'm struck by is that to trust anyone is a risk. Yeah. Because human beings are not perfect. Yeah. And families are not perfect and organizations are not perfect. So I think that it's interesting because, yes, we do have to be thoughtful and strategic about when and where and who we trust. On the other hand, we can carry that too far and basically not trust anybody because there's risk involved. Maybe they'll disappoint us. Maybe we'll delegate to somebody and trust that they have what it takes to get it done. And we find out and discover not not yet, not really. Yeah. 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 It's so true. Do you have any examples of, of kind of, you know, we both coached a lot, but what comes to mind when, when you think of organizations that are dealing with, with broken trust? Mm. Well, I, I completely resonate with your example about leaders who feel like they have to act like they're always seeking consensus mm. and they aren't and nor should they. Uh, But they present, you know, decisions and ideas as if they're completely open and they're not. I think a lot of it's about just being clear. You know, sometimes we're we're going so fast and furiously these days. We'll get on a a Zoom call or have a meeting. It's about making a decision and we haven't had time to really prepare and think our way through it. And we don't even know where we are in the decision-making process, right? And so we just start talking about it. And maybe as a leader, we're not being clear who's going to make the decision. How is the decision going to be made and when? And it's not because we're being duplicitous. We just haven't figured that out yet. But that can break trust too. I mean, trust is broken in lots of small little ways that we are often unaware of. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. You know, there's one other thing that struck me when you were talking as well, and this may seem kind of counter to what people would think, but I often think a lack of conflict is a sign of low trust. I think when people have really good conflict in the sense of, of, of really debating ideas and putting forward your position... And, and when there's a lack of trust, I find meetings are very boring, <laughs> but no one really, no one really wants to stick their head out. Yeah. And, and inherently, you know, when we're willing to have healthy conflict, yeah. you know, that's a sign of trust. That's a sign of a group of people that know that each other, you know, they're, that they're not afraid to say things and, and that they know each, each person is each other's back and it's okay to have conflict. Yeah. In fact, you know, when there's a high degree of trust, it is amazing what can be said, Mm -hmm. what kind of issues can actually be addressed between people, between couples, between, you know, colleagues, partners, or what, what have you. And, and of course the reverse is true, what you just said. All right. So, so what happens a lot is inadvertently we break trust. We, you know, we, we say and do things that have that effect. We may or may not recognize it. And I guess I'm wondering about the notion of forgiveness. Like, do you know, how do we, does forgiveness play a role in this? Oh, it does. You know, for me, I think very often we feel that forgiveness is something that we give to another person. And I always like to look at forgiveness as the ultimate act of freedom for ourselves. Mm -hmm. That basically, when we are trying to come to terms with moving on and in some way accepting that trust is being broken, but I'm willing to repair it, then in some way forgiveness has to happen. And forgiveness doesn't mean that we forget. It doesn't mean that we're not angry, but it does mean that I am not going to stew in resentment and bitterness, Yeah, that I'm choosing 
to move on and to begin to repair the trust that's being broken. And so therefore, I think forgiveness and forgiveness is, is not a single act. You know, I think, you know, you were talking about, I mean, trust being, being caught every day, you know, forgiveness is a daily act as well, especially when we're working or living with the person who's violated our trust. Yeah. Therefore, I think it's an opportunity that we have to revisit that and revisit that decision to move on and to repair mm-hmm. trust. And you know what this is reminding me of? It's reminding me of a practice that we've talked about in a previous episode or two, and that is um, to really grant forgiveness. We have to get on the balcony because we have to step back from the emotional intensity yeah. of maybe the disappointment, the breakdown, the frustration that we have in somebody, you know. And we got to step back and get curious yeah. and say, well, what's that person up against? Yeah. You know, what pressures are they dealing with that might have led them to do X, Y, and Z? Doesn't mean that we condone it, like you said, right? But sometimes people are doing the best they can and it might not look particularly pretty, <laughs> yeah. but they're doing the best they can. Okay. So I guess we need to talk about this whole notion of repairing trust. Yep. Right. Like what, yep. what, what does that look like? How, how do we do that? Cause if the listeners are probably going, okay, get to the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me mention a few things that, that come to mind for me. Number one, and I think it's really important is to acknowledge the issue. You know, very often you were talking, you know, about if there is trust, it's amazing the type of conversations you can have. Yeah. But I think the first building block is to call out the elephant in the room that, you know what? Trust has been broken. And for whatever reason it has been broken, it's the acknowledgement that it has been broken and the acknowledgement that this is not just, you know, a click of the fingers and everything will be okay again, but the acknowledgement that depending on the type of trust that was broken, it may take a little bit of time. And um, we have to acknowledge that perhaps the hurt is run deeper and Mm -hmm. that we may have to work on this and to recommit ourselves to the fact that we really want a trusting relationship or a trusting situation. So I think acknowledging that and, you know, it goes back to some of the things we've talked in earlier episodes as well about our self-awareness. You know, are we aware of this situation? Are we aware of perhaps that other people have been hurt in this? Mm-hmm. And all of that is really part of our awareness, both of self and others, that that acknowledgement, that the trust and, and we can, you know, feel that in the room and to be able to acknowledge and express that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, if somebody says to us that there's been a trust breakdown of sorts to, to not react to that mm. with defensiveness takes a lot of self-regulation, yeah. Yeah. right? Totally. Because no, because again, nobody means to break trust. It just sometimes happens. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second thing I would say, kind of going into the, you know, the, the defensive there, the lack of defensiveness is this receptivity, this listening. And I think part of that is to allow the feelings and emotions to surface. So I think people have expectations and whenever trust is being violated, I think it's important for people to be able to verbalize you know, what's happening within them? How did this hit me? And that's a tricky balance because at times when trust being violent, we may not want to express how we feel. And so therefore, the leader may have to be patient here. And again, may have to be patient to, you know, give a little time to be aware that trust being violated. And it's going to take a little time to repair that and to be much more receptive to how people feel and to leave open spaces for that to be verbalized. And I think that's a process as well, but people need to feel once again, that they, they feel safe enough to be able to verbalize those feelings. Mm -hmm. That makes good sense. Yeah. I would go so far as to say to those listening, and this includes me Mm -hmm. and includes you that right now we have probably said or done something in the last few months that created just a little bit of an erosion in trust Mm -hmm. with somebody and we were unaware of it. Yeah. Right. And maybe the person's moved on and, and you know, it's all fine or maybe they haven't, but I think it's, it's that 
ubiquitous, shall I say, that the pace of organizational life, right, and the way we're all stretched so thin, we can kind of almost expect that there's going to be little breakdowns. But the good news is, if you address it and do some of the things that you're talking about, actually trust is greater on the other side of that. That's the possibility is that we can actually build a stronger relationship with a colleague, our boss, yep. if, we ha- or if we're willing to engage in these things that we're talking about. Absolutely. Any other uh, tips, Bridget, for building trust? I think we've said most of them, but I guess the only thing I would add is the question that we posed before on this um, podcast is, are you willing to step back in any kind of breach of trust and ask yourself the question from the balcony, what's my part in this? I mean, even if you're befuddled by that and you don't understand why there is a breakdown in trust, do you have the fortitude to say, hmm, interesting. I wonder what my part in this is. And you know, one of the common ways I think leaders inadvertently break trust and nobody tells them is a simple thing like this. They don't do their performance evaluations on time. Mm -hmm. They reschedule their check-in meetings several times in a row. You know, little things like this, because what does that communicate to the person? Maybe not, uh, maybe a lack of care. Yeah. Or, or it could even indicate, you know, you're not quite as, you're not important. That's right. Which is people, oh, okay. You know, if, if I was really important, then you would do this. Yeah. So I think uh, maybe we should think about a practice that might help people. For those of you who aren't aware, Bridget uh, co-authored a wonderful book called Missing Conversations, and uh, there's a chapter in there about relationships and trust, et cetera. So Bridget, I know that you have a couple of questions, which you call a trust audit. Mm -hmm. So maybe that might be a great exercise for us to finish today. Yeah, sure. So, So really, it centers around three basic questions to do a trust audit. And the first one is to kind of step back and ask yourself, Who on my team would I like to have a greater level of trust in than I do now? And by team, it could be the team you're managing, or it could be the, if you're part of a senior team, it could be your colleagues or even your boss, right? So so who on those teams would you maybe like to trust more, but you just don't? Mm -hmm. And so they start there. And so I invite you as you're listening, who is that person for you? And think about it. And then the second question is, okay, so the trust is not at the level I would like. What is my assessment based on? Now that requires us to really step back and think about those four areas that we talked about that make up a trust assessment, right? Do I believe the person cares? Are they sincere? Are they competent? Are they reliable? Because sometimes we don't ground our assessment. Uh, at all. We just say, I don't trust them. Mm-hmm. They're not trustworthy. Well, in what area are they not trustworthy? So I'll give you an example of this the person I was working with coaching. She said, I don't trust my boss. And I said, would you like to trust your boss more? And she goes, yeah, but I don't. And I said, well, what are you basing that assessment on? We went through it and I shared those four areas. And she says, I guess I just don't trust that she cares enough to advocate for me. I think she cares, but I don't know that she cares enough to advocate for me when the, when the heat is on. I said, but what about other domains? Like, is this person a good mentor? Oh yeah. She, she actually really is a good mentor. Mm -hmm. Is the per, does the person take time for you? Do they check in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do all that stuff, but I can't count on her to advocate for me. And I said, okay, so it's not that you don't trust her completely. It's that there's been a little bit of a breakdown then. So then the third question is, what's the missing conversation? Mm -hmm. Because inevitably there is one. And I posed that question to her and she said, you know, I don't think the missing conversation is with her because I don't think she's going to see this even if I brought it to her. And I think she might get defensive and she really is a pretty decent manager. I think the missing conversation is with myself. Mm Like, I think I just have to accept that that is right now the way it is. 
And then we went on to talk about how maybe what she needs to do is strengthen her own self-advocacy muscle, right? Instead of wishing that she could trust her boss to do it more. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the basic gist of the trust audit. And those questions can be used in the family system too, as well as the work system. Absolutely. Well, that's really powerful. Really, really powerful. And I know as uh, we wrap up our episode today, I am leaving with those four distinctions of trust in, in a powerful way. And I think it's such a great way to evaluate what's happening when we blurt out those words, I don't trust you, you know? And so is it care? Is it sincerity? Is it reliability? Is it competence? So uh, thank you everyone for listening today. Hopefully you're taking away some nuggets to chew on before our next episode. And our next episode actually is going to be on finding your leadership voice. So Bridget, thanks so much. Always great to be in conversation with you. Thank you, Irvin. And thanks everyone for listening. Make sure to spread the word and to share this episode with anyone who you think might find uh, it useful. And until the next episode, I hope you are doing well and have a wonderful weeks ahead. Take care. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.